Yeah, it's it's so good to to reread. You know, there's some books that um, after you read the first chapter, you should not even consider continuing. Um, <laughs> it's okay to put books down when you feel like they're not valuable. There's other books that you read them once and you're like, I got the most important parts of this. I've marked it up. I'm going to come back to it maybe in writing, but rereading perhaps is not the, the best idea. And then there's other books where you can spend your whole life rereading them. And every time you will get something new. And I, I think that uh, Engels' text is one of those, obviously, capital. Um, and uh, for me, Hegel. And it, these are texts that, you know, when I'm in the middle of in the um, sort of interregnum between research projects, I pick up random stuff. And usually the random stuff is like t rereading the same stuff that's like really, really important. And I always notice something new or or and am able to focus in on the same thing from a different angle and it enriches the process of of knowing the text yeah absolutely i've had that experience with capital after reading it a couple times um capital volume two i got like oh a little more than a third of the way through it and then restarted at a point now i'm pretty well over halfway um, and yeah, like you said, each time you learn something new, um, like now going back and I've been reading capital volume two again, um, and the Gundrissa and origin. So I got to freaking choose one. I think I'll probably finish capital two volume two before I go back to the Gundrissa, just cause yeah. reading the Gundrissa made me want to finish volume two. Um, but regardless, after studying healthcare and healthcare administration, um, you know, I was looking at the circulation of capital through like a whole new lens because I've mm -hmm. studied the economics of healthcare and the accounting of healthcare, um, which, you know, capital is basically like it's almost like a work of accounting or like theory of accounting. Like, how do we measure and interpret value and how do we understand how value is changed and how value becomes profit or surplus value? Um, so if you look like in the modern field of healthcare administration, the way they study revenue cycles and the, the way that corporations make profit and make money, they're explaining to a T the, the same circuit of capital, the circuit of industrial capital that Marx explains in, in Capital Volumes 1 and 2 um, and talking about the, the production of surplus value. Um, so like David Harvey actually says that in his breakdown of capital, he's like, he's taught the book 40 times and every time he does it with a different group of people, you know, he'll do it with like anthropologists and then he does it with people who are like, you know, English majors or whatever. And they always bring a new perspective, a new point of view um, from their own field. And, you know, they, they all learn something different from that book because capital, you know, applies to everything in a capitalist society. So, you know, everybody can come at it with their own perspective and, and learn unique things, you know, and, and, you know, if you read the book now and then you read it five years later, you yourself are going to bring a new perspective the second time you read it as well as understanding it better. Um, so yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. And those books are just timeless. Um, yeah. It's a real shame that they're, they're unfinished. Um, and, mm -hmm. uh, we don't treat them as manuscripts, but in reality, they they kind of are. They're not manuscripts in as a um, in the same way that the Grandrisa uh, um, manuscripts are. But you know, they were put together by Engels, and I mean, Marx publishes the first volume in '67. He dies in '83, so he had maybe. Um, more than enough time so that if he felt that volume one was genuinely finished, he could have moved on to the other ones and finished those. But he kept on trying to like refine volume one and towards the end of his life, the volume of capital that he was still working on was uh, volume one of capital. I, I think he was working on a third version of uh, an English, uh, a, a German edition a third German edition of Capital. Um, and he spent some time, there was a person that translated big chunks of it to French. And um, when, the, when the guy sent him the 
the draft, Marks thought it was a mess. So in the process of him fixing that translation, there was new things that he was able to add. And so it's, you know, it's pretty crazy because like even even the volume that is finished is kind of unfinished, or at least for Marks, it was still kind of unfinished. He was still developing it. And um, I'm, I, I wonder whether it, it could ever be the sort of project that is finished just because it's it's analyzing a totality and movement, which is capitalist production as a whole. And insofar as it continues moving, there's always areas that you can refine and and concretize in light of what certain analysis from two years ago unfolded into. Um, and, um, you know, it makes it difficult. I, I do agree with the comment that some people have made in the past, which is that, you know, to, to, to fully and comprehensively understand like the first volume, you need to see how it unfolds into the second and third one. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's a comment that might sound audacious to people because they look at the first volume and they're like, okay, this is a fairly big book. And then if someone tells them like, hey, you know, and if you really want to understand this, you have to read these other two really big books. That's, that's kind of messed up. You know, that's, it's like Lenin, you know, saying that if you want to understand capital, you have to understand the whole of Hegel's science of logic. <laughs> but, you know, it's, um, there's a certain truth to that that's almost commonsensical. Like if you, if you want to know the first part of The Godfather in the best form possible, it is genuinely accepted that you would have to watch the trilogy um, so that you can know what the developments in that first movie unfold into. And it's the same thing with capital. Like you can, you can understand the categories that appear in the first volume, but you understand them in a much more refined and comprehensive and integrated fa fashion when you see what they unfold into in volume two and then what those unfold into in volume three. And uh, those that are later on are there not because it's arbitrarily just assembled in whatever form. They're there because in order to understand those, you need to understand all the ones that come before that. So there's a there's a logic to the development of capital that I think it's important to follow. And not that it's wrong to just read the first one or like work on themes that are within the first one if people haven't read the, the other ones, but um, it, it should always be kept in mind that a more refined analysis is always uh, going to come about reading the whole, um, which is itself incomplete, but. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting reading the Gundrissa and seeing what Marx actually had planned, you mm -hmm. know, for capital. He had five or six volumes or, oh you know, at some points like eight or nine volumes planned out. His plan changed with time, but <clears throat> I was thinking to reading the Gundrissa, like he wanted he lays sort of the basis for capitalist crises uh, really in volume two and volume one, volume one as well. Um, I haven't mm -hmm. read volume three yet, obviously, but um, he lays the, you know, sort of material basis for what creates crises, but he had planned mm -hmm. this, you know, fourth or fifth volume that would focus on crises specifically. Mm -hmm. And, and that would lay out the different kinds of capitalist crises and how they work. And, We've been talking to Radhika Desai and Alan Freeman lately, and that's a lot of what Radhika has been doing in her work is, mm -hmm. you know, detailing, concretizing what are the different forms of crisis, you know, how do they function and what are their effects? You know, how are, you know, monetary crises unique from other kinds of crises, which is something Marx wanted to do. So, you know, it shows that there's a lot um, that, you know, still to be explored and still to be expanded yeah. on when it comes to, you know, understanding capitalism and, and expanding Marx's analysis. And like you said, capitalism is always changing. So the analysis will always change as well. Um, and, you know, another one that Marx wanted to write, which, which, you know, I see Jacob talking about the German ideology, uh, which he's reading right now in the chat. Um, the German ideology is sort of like the closest thing we have to um, Marx and Engels explaining their conception of the dialectic versus Hegel's, even though, you know, the German ideology was never supposed to be published. It's like a collection of notebooks and, and whatever. Um, but Marx had plans, you know, to do this full um, explanation of here's the Marxist dialectic versus the Hegelian dialectic. He just never had time to do it, you know, so that's, you know, sort of leaves the job for us to continue that analysis. And 
I don't know. It's funny when people try and uh, pretend like Marxism is a dogma or Marxism <laughs> is some kind of religion. I've heard people say, you know, why would you call yourself a Marxist? That's like calling yourself a Christian or, you know, saying you're an adherent to, to one person. It's like, no, <laughs> you know, it, it's just the name of the, the school of thought, which right. is constantly developing, constantly changing, constantly building on itself um, and is contributed to by, you know, many more people um, than just Karl Marx. Um, with, uh, what's the word Rock Hill uses? He says it's like a living, breathing, a living, breathing spirit, spirit, spirit. analysis. Yeah. Some, yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's some people. Hill. There's some people that prefer to just call it scientific socialism. Um, and I think that's fair. It is uh, what it is. Uh, but um, I agree with, with uh, using Marxism as a label, although Marxism, Engelsism would perhaps be more correct because um, we, we should never undermine the contributions that Engels makes and how he sets the stage for the best parts of Marx as well. Um, yeah, you mentioned the, the theme of crisis. It's so interesting. Um, I don't think many people know what the etymology of the word crisis is. It, it depicts a separation of things that shouldn't be separated, a certain distance between parts that should be together. And uh, that's the core of the contradiction in 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 the commodity um, and in, in commodity production, a separation between the buying and the selling, which is at the core of the crisis, and it's um, it's a it's a crisis or a separation that then ends up reflecting itself in a variety of other ways. And he describes the general crisis of capital in in he says that. In, in theories of surplus values, he says that it's a, it's a manifestation of all the crises or, or of all the contradictions of capitalism showing itself up at once. Um, so it's, 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 I think, in, in one of the more uh, deep waters that you can get into in the study of Marxism. And it's, we're very glad that we can have people like Alan Freeman and, and Radica Desai, professional economists that you know they're they're at home in those later volumes when um, when he's talking about crisis and these phenomena that are since they're the most concrete they're the ones that require the most study to get to to know to comprehend it correctly. Um, yeah, there was a, another comment that you made about someone brought up the German ideology. Um, there, one of the things that like the anti. Marxist Leninist crowd is trying to do in, in Marxist scholarship is discredit the the validity of the German ideology because it was it was initially planned out to be a journal. So they had like a Marx Engels and a few other young Hegelians had a plan to do a journal and they had gotten someone who was going to fund it. And so they did the articles for like two issues, basically. Um, and then the the thing fell through and Marx and Engels tried to publish it as a book. They rejected the, the they rejected it. And so they, um, you know, there's this phrase that they both repeat a few times um, throughout their life, which is that, you know, it served as a way for them to clear their ideas about this new worldview that they had, that they were developing. Um, but portions of the big one, you know, people usually read the, the smaller one, which is like part one on Feuerbach. Um, it's actually like a, you know, pretty dense, uh, uh, big text, and uh, portions of the big ones are actually written by, um, by some of the young Hegelians that Marx and Engels worked uh, with. I can't remember uh, precisely who they were, but um, I, I still think that it's a very much an important text uh, that, uh, you know, I, I don't think of it as any less now that like these revelations have came out that it's not actually like a book that they intended to write. I mean, um, dude, there's so much valuable stuff that Marx didn't want to publish because he was oh my God. not insecure, but he was, you know, like obsessive about the form of presentation and making sure everything he said was perfect, you know, because 
being that Marxism is a science and that at the time, you know, they couldn't work that cooperatively as academics. It was mostly just Marx and Engels trying to expound this science and, and you know, do this, this scientific analysis. So he has to be insanely rigorous without much help. You know, he's got to be insanely rigorous on his own, which means a lot of time intensive and energy intensive work on his part. So he was obsessive about, you know, how we presented this information and making sure that it was scientifically accurate. Um, so there's so much, you know, valuable stuff that was never published, you know, um, that's probably 95 to 100 percent accurate um, that, you know, especially beginners can learn from. And I remember you telling me years ago when we were still an undergrad to read um, German ideology because you had been going through it. And, you know, I always regretted not starting with that. Instead, I dove mm -hmm. right into capital, um, which was fine. But then, you know, in between my first and second readings of capital and, and sort of, you know, reading a lot of these like basic or, um, you know, sort of classic Leninist texts or stuff written by Stalin or whatever. Um, after reading much of that, I picked up the German ideology and I was like, wow, this is so clear cut. You know, this helps me understand uh, this, the philosophical portion of this so much. It helps me understand, you know, what the Hegelian dialectic is, you know, what Marx and Engels actually use it for. And, you know, it makes it pretty clear. Um, so, you know, just because it's not something that Marx intended to publish or it wasn't in the finished form of presentation doesn't mean it can't be useful, you know, right. and especially for people, once you get sort of more well-versed in dialectical materialism and Marxism, you don't have to take everything Marx and Engels say is, you know, dogmatically true or fact, like it's the Bible, you know, you can uh, criticize or question or, you know, wonder maybe this has changed now today. Um, especially when you're reading their less finished works. And they did that. Um, Engels mm -hmm. was the one who found it when he was asked, uh, he was asked to do a reply to a book that had been done on Ludwig Feuerbach. And they, the editors of the main, uh, of the main, uh, newspaper of the German social democratic party, they asked Engels to do a reply. Um, where he would lay out his and Marx's views on Hegel and, and Feuerbach. And so he went to go look for uh, those large uh, octave volumes, as he called it, um, which were the German ideology. And he read it and he's, you know, he, he thought it was good, but he thought that it was unfinished in a couple, in a couple of ways. Uh, one of which is the fact that uh, the knowledge itself was unfinished. The, they didn't have as concrete an understanding of capitalism. Um, as they would develop later on. And, you know, we know Marx's really intense uh, studies of capitalism don't take place until the 50s, the mid 1850s, late 1850s. And, you know, you start to get these manuscripts like the Grundrisse, which are 1857 to 1859. The German ideology is written in, you know, 1845 to six. Uh, and um, so it's, it's well before they had a really, really good refined understanding of 